This is Distant Replay. Well, Lawrence Phillips was a very, very well-known and popular football player when he played that Nebraska team in the 90s, was dominant. They were one of the great football programs, and thanks in part to what Lawrence Phillips was able to do. But his life took uh, a number of different turns and ultimately ended in 2016. On this episode of Distant Replay, we are going back to true crime, talking about Lawrence Phillips. This is part one of two. And Mike, welcome in. Part one, Mike, what do we, what's the plan for this one? Why, why are we splitting it up into two? What's the goal here? Well, first off, Ben, this is the most requested true crime sports um, topic that we've had recommended in the comments since we started doing this podcast. So if you look back at our comments, people are always asking us when we're going to do Lawrence Phillips. So mm-hmm. um, we decided to do it in two parts because – his true crime story sort of interweaves with his football career. There's like no two ways about it. So this first episode is going to bring us from his early life through his time at Nebraska. And then the second episode will bring us from the beginning of his NFL career to the end of his life. And that's that's sort of how I thought the best way to structure it um, because his true crime story, um, again, is pretty consistent throughout his whole life. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So this episode will be through college, and then uh, make sure you hit subscribe wherever you listen and be ready for part two. It'll be coming out in a week. But also you'll find us online at distantreplaypodcast.com. You'll find us on YouTube. Hit subscribe there. Like the video. We do appreciate everybody there. And also Twitter and Instagram. So Lawrence Phillips, we, you know, most people know about him. Now he's almost been, you know, he's almost, his playing career was over 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. So there might be more and more people that just aren't really familiar with Lawrence Phillips. So let's start off, Mike, with his upbringing. Yeah, so he grew up in Inglewood, California, right near South Central. If you look at, you know, when his heyday was as a player, it was in the, you know, mid, early to mid 90s, right? So that would put him growing up in LA in the 80s. And I think anyone who just follows culture knows that it was not a great place to grow up where he grew up all right he spent his first 10 years in that in in that environment in that sort of very dangerous violence very common for him to be around and unfortunately for lawrence the violence even trickled its way into his own home all right he spent his first 10 years in that environment his family relocated ben from arkansas to california his father had left the family and his mother you know maybe looking for more opportunity or just looking for a change of scenery, decided to move the family to to California. Now, the first sort of planting the seeds kind of issues for Lawrence Phillips was he was mentally and physically abused from a very young age, Mm -hmm. all right? His mother, by all accounts, paid very little attention to him. I'll give you an example. Um, In doing my research, I watched some documentaries and I read some stories, and like they couldn't find any childhood pictures of Lawrence Phillips to include in any of those pieces. Oh man, that's sad. He, you know how like we some of the most terrible stories we've done, we've been able to track down like information about the person's early life or pictures, and there's just nothing. Like he was v- largely ignored by his mother. His mother would have men coming in and out of the house that also physically and mentally abused him. Mm. And there was a story of a man that his mother was dating that Lawrence did something like a little kid did something that the the man disapproved of and the the man pinned him down put his put his foot on lawrence's back and urinated on him because he did something wrong Jeez. so this is the kind of like neglect and abuse he's dealing with all right and what how this would manifest itself by all people's accounts is because he he always felt rejected by his mother it would sort of lead to some of the issues he would have later in his life dealing with women specifically yeah. You're going to notice that as a common thread with pretty much all the issues he was involved in um, as an adult. Okay. Okay. So I, like I said, he grows up in this environment for the first 10 years of his life. He runs away in fifth grade. So he lived with friends. He lived in cars. He lived anywhere but home. And he missed like an entire week of school. I'm uh, sorry, an entire year of school because of this. Mm. He wasn't really getting in trouble at this time. He was just sort of hanging out and not going to school. Yeah. On the flip side, when Lawrence was in middle school and high school, he like tested as like gifted on those standardized tests they give. Remember those standardized tests we used to take when we were kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So much so that he completed like two grades of high school when he was in high school to make up for missing the fifth grade. Like this was something that would come up commonly where people would be like, hey, Lawrence, why don't you go to like the fifth grade? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and uh, 
But the common thread with him was, you know, people seeing potential in him as he was growing up. But at the same time, him, you know, just being in really, really dangerous environments that impacted his behavior as well. At age 11, right, he, he this is at the time where he just got off of not going to school for a full year. His mother obviously can't control him or didn't want to control him. And he became a ward of the, a ward of the state at age 11. OK, hmm. he was put into a place that's known in L.A. circles as McLaren Hall. And it was basically like a home for troubled kids that by all accounts is pretty much the worst environment you could you could ever hope for a kid to be in. Right. Whether it was dealing with issues from the other residents there in terms of fighting and, and violence, issues with the staff that worked at McLaren Hall. You know, there was it was just a very dangerous environment for a kid to be growing up in. It led to all for the people who, you know, who had who stayed there. It led to all kinds of anxiety, mental problems, physical problems, you know, just led to a whole bunch of issues that an environment like that can lead to. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. And he was there for like a year. So it's not like he was there for a couple of months and then left. You know, I mean, this place was so bad, Ben, that it got closed down for good in 2003. Like they were just like, hey, yeah, they was like, hey, look, no one can, this place, I don't know why it took that long based on some of the stories that I read that Lawrence went through there and that other people who, who were residents there went through. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it even lasted to 2003, but what happens is after he spends almost a year at this McLaren Hall, he gets placed in a group home in West Covina, California. So like a nicer neighborhood, you yeah. know? Um, not like the greatest living circumstances, but a lot better than what he was used to, you know, little things like he had his own room, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, he was just allowed to be a, a kid more often. He's still getting into trouble at the group homes though. He's getting into like, you know, you have these kids from the foster system in these group homes. And this is right around the age where kids in that area started joining gangs. So they would come from the bad neighborhoods but not far enough from where they lived into these group homes, you know? Yeah. So a lot of them would dip back into their old neighborhoods and their old friends. I mean, there's no record of him ever joining a gang, but like some of the kids he was in these group homes with are like beginning gang members, you know, and he's getting into vicious fights with them. At the same time, he's getting more and more involved into sports, obviously specifically football. He attends West Covina High, plays on the freshman team, and he's like clearly the best player on the team. You know, this is where we're getting into now him becoming like the physical freak of nature that we know him as. One thing consistent about Lawrence Phillips from a physical perspective is he was always the fastest, always the strongest wherever he went. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Plays on the freshman team. His sophomore year, his mother actually came back in the picture for a little while and wanted to take him back to Arkansas. I guess she was going to go back to Arkansas and live where they're originally from. Yeah. And basically he lived with her for a week. And she basically gave him back to the state. Dang, like man. whatever went on, like she, again, either he was too much to deal with or she didn't want to deal with him after dealing with him again. So mm-hmm. we had a little pit stop with his mother. After that, he transfers to Baldwin Park High School, which was like, they were like a bet. They were in the same area as West Covina, but they were considered to be like a better football program. Yeah. So he want, and that's where a lot of his like mentors, he would find a lot of his mentors in the form of coaches, athletic directors, you know, people that sort of brought him along uh, to reach his potential, right? Because remember, we're talking about an incredibly gifted football player here, okay? At Baldwin Park is where he takes two years of high school in one year to make up for missing that fifth grade, remember? I talked about before. Mm-hmm. Um, this is where he gets labeled as gifted on the standardized test he takes, and that's really what catches Tom Osborne's eye, is Tom Osborne, the coach of Nebraska, the legendary coach of Nebraska, he knew the issues that Lawrence Phillips had. I mean, Ben, you're you're a huge college football fan. You know the kind of research they do into these kids before they offer them scholarships. So, yeah. like, they, he knows about Lawrence's upbringing, his, his, you know, his his scrapes with the law. But he says, look, this is a gifted kid that I think once we get him to Nebraska, he's gifted both on the football field, obviously, and somewhat, you know, in the classroom, that we can get him on the straight and narrow if we surround him with the proper environment. You know, so he's obviously being recruited by everyone, decides to go to Nebraska. And like Ben mentioned at the top of the episode, we're right in 90s Nebraska football. We're in the heyday of Nebraska football um, in the mid 90s. 
uh, me and Ben did a entire episode on the Fiesta Bowl between Florida and Nebraska, and we talked a lot about how this is considered some of these teams they had here, specifically in 94 and 95, were considered some of the best college teams ever. Yeah, no question. Some of the best that ever played. And, and you'll have those arguments to this day that these were. Even with the great teams we've seen in the 2000s, like these teams could stack up with any of them. And, and the two names you associate with those teams are Lawrence Phillips and Tommy Frazier. Yep, absolutely. Um, those are – you still – whenever you hear, hey, who are the best college running backs you've ever seen? Lawrence Phillips may not be one or two, but he's always in the top five or ten yeah. whenever I'm thinking about. And, you know, college sports are unique, right? It's not like an NFL career. A guy could have a good season or two and really stamp his claim to being, you know, one of the better running backs – Uh, for a given era. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what Lawrence Phillips did. With that said, um, the Nebraska football team at this time, very successful on the field, but they were dealing with a lot of legal issues off the field with some of the players they had. Okay. There was a thought back then that Osborne sort of shifted the type of person he recruited, which led to a lot of success on the field, but having to manage a lot of stuff off the field. We Mm -hmm. see this a lot with college I mean, just think about Urban. I think of Urban Meyer with Florida those years, right? Yeah. It's kind of kind of something similar. He's having, Lawrence is having a lot of success on the field. He's struggling um, to get used to life in Lincoln. It's a huge difference between where he ended up, you know, where he came from mm-hmm. in uh, South Central Los Angeles area to Lincoln, Nebraska, you know? Yeah. Um, there's stories of him, like, taking a car, you know, taking one of his friend's cars and traveling overnight to California to like visit some of his friends hmm. and then just coming right back the next day, hmm. like bizarre stories. But yeah, he really broke out Ben in the Nash on the national scene, his sophomore year in 1994. Okay. He rushed for 1700 yards. And this is the year Ben that they beat Miami in the orange bowl mm-hmm. and they won and they won the national championship. So yeah, great team. Um, yeah. Great team. Like just a incredible team. So going into the 95 season, Ben, he's like the Heisman favorite. So again, I think these teams, because of what I'm about to go over, would become more known for Tommy Frazier. You have to remember there was a moment in time where you have Lawrence Phillips coming off of 1,700 yards as a Nebraska tailback, which is one of the premier positions in college football at this time because they ran the triple option. Okay? Yeah. And you have, going into the 95 season, Lawrence Phillips is the odd-on favorite to win the Heisman. As we get into the 95 season... He has a great game in early September, around September 9th, 10th time frame, Mm -hmm. versus Michigan State. And the significance there, Ben, is this is the first season Nick Saban is the head coach of Michigan State. Right. So, I mean, I heard interviews with Saban saying how, you know, he was just like in awe. He he had just came from being in the NFL with the Browns, and he was like in awe of Lawrence Phillips Mm -hmm. and what he could do on the football field. So he's coming off of a huge game versus Michigan State. This is at Michigan State. The team travels home, okay? And during this time leading up to this weekend, he had been, Lawrence had been in an on-again, off-again relationship with a basketball player named Kate McEwen. Right. All right? This is like the first time anyone can remember him having like a steady girlfriend. And by all accounts, their relationship was very intense and very rocky and very on and off, Okay. You know, people had witnessed arguments between the two, nothing ever physical, right? But just a lot of shouting matches, things of that nature. And Osborne basically told him, look, I'd prefer if you didn't see her because it, it's, it's heading down a road where it could lead to something bad happening, you know? And being a college kid, you know, he sort of doesn't listen to his coach and doesn't listen to other people that are trying to tell him, hey, maybe it's not a great idea for you to be with her. Yeah. All right. He's expecting, I'm going to come home from Michigan State, and I'm going to go on a date with this Kate McEwen. Well, he gets back to campus, and he can't get in touch with her on the phone in true 1990s fashion. It was really the only way to get in touch with someone, right? Right. So he, she's out with her friends, and he goes to a party with his friends. So one thing that's important to remember here is like he's consistently drinking throughout the night after getting home from Michigan State, mm-hmm. okay? And she ends up hanging out with her friends, and linking up with Scott Frost. Now, at this point, I think we all know Scott Frost, all right, yeah. who Scott Frost is now. He's a coach now, but people may, may forget he was a very good quarterback 
and an NFL defensive back as well. But he was a, most notably a quarterback for Nebraska. So at this point, Frost is a transfer to Nebraska and obviously not playing. He wouldn't have played anyway because Tommy Frazier is the quarterback at this time. Okay. Yeah. But she ends up back at the apartment of Scott Frost after hanging out with her friends. All right. Someone calls Lawrence and says, basically, hey, look, it's like at this point, it's like 3 a.m. And says, hey, Kate is still, you know, Kate is still at Scott Frost's apartment, you know, basically telling Lawrence, like, hey, look, you, the girl you think you're with or the girl that you're in an on again, off again relationship is like messing around with one of your teammates right now, mm -hmm. you know. So Lawrence, it's one of these classic things where he's been drinking, he hears this news and he just starts to get like really jealous of what's going on in the apartment, right? Yeah. He's thinking, I'm going to go on a date with this girl. And then he's hearing at 3 a.m. that she's in a teammate's you know, room staying over for the night, right? So in a jealous rage, after, a little bit after 3 a.m., he drives like to the other side of Lincoln, where Scott Frost's apartment was, and knocks on his door, mm -hmm. right? So the girl, the girl McEwen, knows it's Lawrence. She looks through the, the little peephole and sees that it's Lawrence, Scott Frost gets up. She goes and gets Scott Frost and says, hey, look, Lawrence is at the door. You know, he doesn't look happy, whatever. He goes and looks through the people and doesn't see anyone. So he tells Kate McEwen, like, hey, look, there's no one here. We can just go back to bed. Well, what they don't know at that time is Lawrence is, like, scaling up uh, the fire escape in the back of the building to enter Frost's apartment through, like, the patio, you know, through, like, the deck door. You know, those college mm -hmm. apartments have, like, a little patio. Yeah, no surprise me. He's like the physical freak that he was. That like, exactly he could do that, no problem. So he's he literally scaling up, you know, the back wall of the apartment complex, and enters the apartment. This is this is the story that multiple accounts say. Now, st something about this is a little confusing to me, and I'll I'll let you know what what it is here in a second. But by all accounts, Scott Frost tried to like calm him down. He took Scott Frost and basically like by the neck and threw him against the wall. Okay. Mm -hmm. He then proceeded to take McEwen by the hair. Now, we're in like a third floor apartment right now, okay? So it's crazy he even scaled up that high, first of all. Yeah. But the second thing is the reason why the significance of the third floor is he grabbed her by her hair, intermittently like punching her in the face, choking her, and dragged her down three flights of steps, okay, by the hair. Literally dragged her down three flights of steps. Now, while this is going on, people obviously hear it, because she's like screaming the whole time. Mm -hmm. He gets her to like the bottom, like lobby area of the apartment complex and like is hitting her head against the ground and the wall, like a real vicious beating. Okay. On his way out, you know, those mailboxes, like those metal mailboxes in apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He literally punched through like three of them, Jeez. like indented them into the wall. Right. Right. So, I mean, this is going on. People come to her aid. He flees the apartment building. Now, what I don't understand, Ben, is we have no other than Frost getting thrown up against the wall. There's no other war mention of him that I could find anywhere in this incident. So I'm not too sure if he got thrown against the wall and just, just didn't help her at all, which is kind of strange to me. But this entire time this is going on, Scott Frost, by all accounts, is not involved anymore. Okay. Yeah, this is always an odd part of the story that you don't really hear about. Yeah, we talked about this when we did the game, too. And it's just mm -hmm. it's still odd to me the more I looked into it because I couldn't find... He's never talked about it publicly, Scott Frost. And Kate McEwen has never talked about it publicly either. Yeah. Okay? So we don't really know the specific... We know what... We, we know from you know court transcripts what he did to her. What this leads to is he turns himself in the next morning to police. All right? If you remember, Ben, he got suspended indefinitely in the moment by Tom Osborne yeah. and, and the program. Now, what happens next is they send him to a, a special hospital in Kansas to get some tests run. Mm -hmm. Basically, Tom, what I, from what I read and what I heard, Tom Osborne basically said, like, I wanted to make sure I didn't have, like, a, a psychopath on my team. Yeah. You know, someone who had legit, like, issues with psychosis. Well, the, the toast has come back that he's like not a psychopath, doesn't have severe psychosis, but that like the infrastructure of the football team may be the only thing keeping him from really going down like a dark path, Yeah, right? That he needs structure. So now Tom Osborne's in a place where do I bring this guy back to the team and get freaking crucified, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's going to get crucified in the media if he brings him back. Or do I do what I think is right for the kid and get him in an environment where... 
you know, he can start playing football again and be a part of the team. And obviously there's the backdrop of if he comes back, he's going to help the team win also, you know? Yeah, exactly. So he decides after only a six game suspension to reinstate Lawrence Phillips. Okay. What I find crazy, Ben, is that Osborne was even the one making this decision to bring him back. Right. That how how in this day and that's that's the kind of, that's influence and that's power from a football coach. We talk about it a lot these days, but think about the most heralded coaches this day and age. I think even Saban Ben, if one of his players did this and he was even thinking about bringing him back, the administration would step in and be like, he can't come back. Yeah, it'd be, you know. Yeah, everybody would would speak out. It just goes to show how different it was even just 25 years ago in the landscape of college sports where a football coach is making this decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. So he comes back. He is a part of the national championship team that we, as we just discussed, goes on to beat Florida in the Fiesta Bowl. So now you have back-to-back undefeated seasons, back-to-back national championships for Lawrence Phillips in his sophomore and junior year. Okay. As I said, Osborne's heavily criticized for the decision to bring him back. Osborne's a guy who had, up to that point, a pristine reputation yeah. as doing things the right way. But you had all these other incidents with football players that I discussed before, and now it sort of reaches a climax here with Lawrence Phillips. What this leads to is, you know, I think it's pretty obvious at this point that he was going to have to leave Nebraska. So after his junior year, he leaves Nebraska to uh, declare for the NFL draft. I wanted to end it here because I think this incident with Kate McEwen – is a major watershed moment in the life of Lawrence Phillips. He would never fully like redeem himself from this incident. Mm -hmm. And this is like a precursor to a lot more incidents that would come um, after he entered the NFL and beyond. Right. Yeah, man, just, just a wild story. And you kind of feel, I mean, you you see that background and hear about the background and you kind of, it's one of those where you just kind of know, like he's headed down that path. And, you know, some people try to step in and try to, you know, mentor him and, and help develop his talent. And he sounded like he had plenty of natural gifts, both physically and, you know, mentally, but just a lot to overcome early in his childhood and you know, carried into college. But definitely some pretty crazy stories in college that, you know, I think not everybody, a lot of people have heard about, but not everyone knows about the college stories. But then, you know, of course, things happen beyond this. So it'll be interesting to see how it all unfolds in, in part two. And for anybody that hasn't heard the story, you'll definitely want to subscribe to hear that one. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to get into that in part two. And look, this is just a classic story of bad upbringing, scarred upbringing, and it manifesting itself in some very, very violent behavior and specifically towards women, which we'll get to even more next week. But looking forward to bringing you guys part two. Again, like Ben said, be sure to subscribe and like, and um, so you can make sure you get uh, that episode next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike, for this. And we'll talk to you all again soon. You got it.